So we're going to cover vascular neoplasms and malformations in this lecture. Vascular neoplasms can behave in a benign manner. They can be more locally aggressive. They can metastasize and they can be, be overtly malignant. So vascular neoplasms can be divided into benign or intermediate behavior or worst case scenario, malignant behavior. This is a list of the different types of vascular malformations that you may observe as you go through dermatopathology and soft tissue pathology. We will cover most of these on this slide today. Before we talk about vascular malformations, it's important to think about the endothelial markers. We use immunohistochemistry to confirm expression of CD31 on endothelial cells. It's more specific for endothelial cells compared to CD34. However, CD34 is typically a more clean stain. It's very sensitive as well. It can mark the endothelial cells in the vessels, but it can also mark more primitive cells. And so CD34 and CD31 give you different information depending on the type of tumor. Li1 is a nuclear marker. Interestingly, it stains about 10% of melanomas and almost all of Ewing sarcomas. It can stain 40% of Merkel cell carcinomas as well. ERG or ERG is probably the most um, popular and utilized nuclear marker of endothelial cells. I use it often in my practice. It stains endothelial cells quite well, and it also stains all of the vascular lesions that were on the previous slide. Oftentimes it's used to confirm an endothelial origin, especially if it is epithelioid proliferation. So the endothelial cells look more epithelioid. So it's very useful to use ERG to confirm that. ERG also can stain urothelium and prostate as well, so it's not entirely exclusive to endothelium. Factor VIII, some people view factor VIII as an unreliable stain. It can stain other cell types like macrophages, dermal dend dendrocytes. It's been shown to be positive in other types of tumors like dermatofibromas, juvenile xanthogranulomas, et cetera. There's another stain called Ulex Europeus lectin. It can also show some clean staining, stains endothelium and epithelium. In my practice, I typically use CD31, CD34, and ERG most commonly in this list. So we're going to start out with probably the most common vascular neoplasm that you will see in the clinic. This is cherry hemangiomas. They are bright red lesions varying in size from hardly visible punctum to a soft raised dome-shaped papule measuring several millimeters in diameter. They often start appearing in adulthood and the number of lesions increases with age. They may occur anywhere, but the trunk and the upper limbs are the most common sites. Here's a clinical example of numerous cherry angiomas. Higher power just to show you the symmetric and well-circumscribed nature of these lesions. Cherry angiomas are thought to be capillary hemangiomas. They have numerous thin-walled vessels. You'll be able to notice pink hyalinized vessel walls. Here's an example of the proliferation of those thin-walled capillary-sized vessels throughout the dermis. You can see the hyalinized nature of the walls in between the lumen here. Next, we're going to talk about an entity called angiokeratoma. There are five well-known types of angiokeratoma. You can have solitary angiokeratomas. This is the most common where you just see a single papule in the lower extremity of a young man, for example. They can occur after trauma. Angiokeratoma circumscriptum is rare. You'll see coalescing papules or plaques on the extremities of children present at birth. Angiokeratoma corporis diffusum, you'll see multiple papules in a bathing suit distribution. You can think of a disease called Fabry's disease, which is due to an X-linked deficiency of alpha-galactosidase and other glucose storage enzyme deficiencies as well. Angiokeratoma of Mabelli, 
results in a warty appearance over bony prominences on the hands and the feet of adolescents. This can also have a component of trauma to it. An angiokeratoma of four dice. Often these are seen in middle-aged older men as solitary or multiple papules on the scrotum, most commonly. Also on the other areas of the genital region, inner thigh, the lower abdomen, and the penis or vulva. Here you can see a well-circumscribed angiokeratoma. Oftentimes the blood is so superficial that it looks like it's a pigmented lesion. So there could be a concern for a pigmented lesion on the, on the rule out. So you might get a, a rule out melanoma, for example, when you look in the slide, you'll be able to ease the concern of the clinician and the patient and tell them that it's not pigmented at all. It's rather a vascular proliferation. So we'll look at the histopathology in a minute here, but this is a, an example of diffuse angiokeratomas that you might see in Fabry's disease. Here are the types of angiokeratomas of Fordyce that occur on the scrotum. Oftentimes um, male patients are very worried about these and we can just reassure them that they are not um, malignant or anything like that, but it could be of cosmetic concern or um, they can oftentimes become irritated and bleed as well. So you can try ablative or destructive therapies for these. Here you can see a more diffuse angiokeratoma on the lower leg. Now, what do you see on the uh, histopathology? Numerous dilated thin-walled congested capillaries in the papillary dermis. They're often so superficial, they look like they're embedded within the endothelium itself or within the epidermis itself. Depending on the plane of section, it can look like they are embedded within the epidermis. They are technically in the papillary dermis. So if you see very large dilated walls in the papillary dermis, um, you can still entertain the idea of angiokeratoma. Dilated vessels, they underlie the epidermis. It shows a variable degree of acanthosis within the epidermis. So that acanthosis often wraps around the dilated lumen and gives that appearance that the vessels are within the epidermis. So here's the low power example of that. It looks like if you were to draw a line, it looks like these dilated capillaries are within the epidermis itself. You often have in different planes of section, a type of access from the lumen up to the, the subcorneal space. You can even see hemorrhage here as well. Another example of angiokeratoma, you can appreciate the dilated vessels. And again, this is another example where it looks like the dilated vessels are even embedded within the epidermis. That's how superficial these dilated vessels are. They're often irritated. You can have hemorrhagic crust or relying lesion itself. Here you see thin-walled ectatic vessels. Again, another example of angiokeratoma. Okay, we're going to move to a type of lymphatic malformation here. So the great majority of tumors of the lymphatic vessels are benign. Most appear to represent developmental abnormalities rather than true neoplasms. So you may have heard me say lymphatic malformation, and that's because Malformations are, are really a result of uh, impaired development as opposed to neovascular or uh, you know, neogenesis of cells dividing and creating more of itself. So you can think of these oftentimes as developmental abnormalities slash malformations rather than true neoplasms. They can be superficial, as in the case of lymphangioma circumscriptum, or they can be deep-seated in the case of cystic hygroma, variant of cavernous mangioma. D240, also known as podoplanin, is the marker you need to know for your exam. It can help distinguish between lymphatic endothelial cells from vascular endothelial cells. Lymphangioma circumscriptum, also known as cutaneous lymphatic malformation, predominantly a developmental malformation of infancy with an equal gender incidence, but may arise at any age. They most frequently affect proximal portions of the limbs and the limb girdle. Typical lesions consist of collections of numerous vesicles containing clear fluid and less commonly blood. Many people liken this to appearing as frog spawn. 
Here you can see the example of that with the frog spawn in lymphangioma circumscriptum, that appearance of just well demarcated clear to yellowish vesicles or papules, it almost looks like. But these are not true vesicles. They're instead dilated endothelial cells that give the appearance of vesicles. Here you see that kind of frog spawn appearance of lymphangioma circumscriptum on the scrotum. So what's the histopathology? You see numerous dilated lymphatics, as expected, in the superficial and papillary dermis. They're filled with clear lymphatic fluid, but can have red blood cells in their lumina. Overlying the epidermis displays some degree of acanthosis and hyperkeratosis, and the surrounding stroma shows scattered lymphocytes. Here you see a dilated thin-walled vessel, mostly filled with lymph fluid and not endothelial cells. In contrast to this thin-walled capillary over here, which is filled mostly with red blood cells. Cystic hygroma, as I said, is a deeper seated lesion. So you see um, relative to, this is just a, a zoomed in shot here. So you can't see how deep it is, but this is a deep um, malformation of thin walled endothelial cells. If you wanted to confirm that these were lymphatic, you would do a D240 podoplanet. Next, we're going to talk about infantile hemangiomas. Infantile hemangiomas are the most common vascular tumor of infancy. The lesions usually first appear between the third and the fifth week of life. They're not present at birth. Typically increase in size for several months to one year, and then they start to regress. They vary greatly in size and have a wide anatomic distribution. They have a predilection for the head and the neck area. And we like to think of this as potential to completely regress by three years and 30%, 50% by five years. And you can imagine as you go along, the percentage of regression increases per year. Everybody has a different rate that they're going to have regression. And unfortunately, not all lesions will regress. However, most of them do. Here's an example of an infantile hemangioma on the face of a young child. If the hemangioma was causing functional defects, you could think about treating with propranolol. Oftentimes, you can get the lesion to regress quickly or quicker with topical timolol. Here you see the regression of the lesion in the same child over time. So several years later, they oftentimes will regress. Another example of an infantile hemangioma. More examples here. You can see the once the regression happens, there is some overlying skin that was expanded and it kind of forms an indentation or dimpling. Unfortunately, these can overgrow and become ulcerated and even infected. And so this would be a clinical indication for propranolol. You can sometimes target the vessels by doing pulse dye laser, depending on the tolerance level of the child and the decisions by the parents. So infantile hemangioma, what's the histopathology? All tumors have a lobular architecture. The microscopic features change as the lesion evolves. So you have a growth period where the endothelial cells are large. They're mitotically active and they aggregate predominantly in a solid strand and masses in which there are only a few small capillary lumina. They're tightly packed in the growth period. In mature lesions, the capillary lumina are wider, they're more ectatic and within the lining, the endothelial cells are often flatter. And in regression lesions, you have progressive fibrosis with the disappearance of blood vessels. The answer you need to know for the test is that GLUT1 positivity helps distinguish these lesions from vascular malformations. From low power, you see these tightly packed clusters of endothelial cells here in the growth phase. Looks very similar to a lobular capillary hemangioma. Now you can have congenital non-progressive hemangiomas. These are present at birth and they're considered more of a vascular malformation. So thus they are GLUT1 negative. 
You'll find lobules of small capillaries separated by thick fibrous bands, stellar intralobular and large intralobular draining vessels, round, slightly hyperchromatic hobnailed endothelial cells without mitosis. And that makes sense because it's not a neoplasm, so they shouldn't really be dividing too much. Fibrosis and myxoid stroma with destruction of adnexal structures. GLUT1 negative, as I said. You can have a rapidly involuting congenital hemangioma in the first six months. You can have non-involuting or partially involuting. These rapidly involuting or non-involuting congenital hemangiomas, also known as rich or niche, oftentimes have GNAC and GNA11 mutations. More about capillary malformations, also known as a nevus flamius or a port wine stain, present at birth, slow growing. They don't resolve. They can develop nodularity and pyogenic granulomas with time. It can be associated with Sturge Weber, Klippel Trinani, and Proteus. GLUT1 is often negative by definition, actually. Here you see an example of a capillary malformation or a nevus flamius. It's got this very flat patch-like growth pattern. Unfortunately, these can develop significant nodularity within the lesion itself. Capillary malformation or nevus, nevus flamius, as you see on histopathology, is composed of kind of nondescript features, dilated thin-walled vessels containing red blood cells are in the superficial dermis. Another example of nevus flamius here. Moving on to angioma serpiginosa. Ange angioma serpiginosa presents as a progressive vascular lesion, oftentimes on the leg of females. The ectatic vessels begin as minute puncta and clusters, but they merge to form a serpiginous array. They often bleed freely when traumatized. Here you see an example clinically of angioma serpiginosa. What are the key features on histopathology? Dilated tortuous capillaries in the dermal papilla and upper dermis. The vessels lack alkaline phosphatase activity. So here you see the dilated vessels within the superficial dermis. They're not filled with as much blood as an angiokeratoma. They are rather just kind of there existing and dilated. And so you can imagine clinically, it doesn't look as dark as an angiokeratoma, it's kind of embedded a little bit deeper under the epidermis there in angioma serpiginosa. Venous lake, this is a very common lesion. We often see it on the lip of patients. You have small, dark blue, slightly raised soft lesions occurring on the exposed skin of elderly people. And usually be emptied of most of the blood using sustained pressure. So you can press on it and um, actually see that the color goes away for a bit until it fills back up again. You might have one or you might have several lesions present on the face, the ears, and the lips. Those are the most common sites. Here's a classic Kodachrome picture of the venous lake. It can often be mistaken for a deeper blue looking lanocytic proliferation. Sometimes people may be concerned about melanoma. And unfortunately, you may have a um, a melanoma or a pigmented lesion that looks very similar to a venous lake rarely present this way. On histopathology, it represents technically a telangiectasia because it's a dilated vessel, shows one greatly dilated space or several interconnected dilated spaces filled with erythrocytes and lined by a single layer of flattened endothelial cells and a thin wall of fibrous tissue. Here's an example of the venous lake you can see here just a large pool of erythrocytes within the dermis. You can often have a separation in between the, the large collections as the pool of dilated um, endothelial space comes in and out of section here. Another example of a thin wall ectatic vessel. You may not see a lot of erythrocytes within the space if they were leaked out during processing, collecting of the specimen. Moving on to glomus tumor. Glomus tumors are relatively rare lesions that usually are present in young adults between the third and fourth decade of life. 
They most commonly affect the hand, particularly the subungual region and the palm. Clinically, they present a solitary small blue-red nodules characteristically associated with paroxysmal pain, often elicited by changes in temperature or pressure. A very small proportion of these can occur and multiply in up to 10% and are thought to be inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. So here's an example of a glomus tumor within the nail. It's a well-circumscribed neoplasm underneath the nail, often painful. Surgically, you can dissect these and they're typically very well-circumscribed tumors. The glomus body is a modified smooth muscle cell of a segment of specialized AV anastomoses derived from the sequit hoyer canal, and that is involved in regulation of temperature. So glomus bodies are usually found in acral skin, particularly the hands. Tumors arising in other locations may arise from pluripotential mesenchymal cells or smooth muscle cells. What is the histopathology of a glomus tumor? You'll see varying proportions of glomus cells, blood vessels, and smooth muscles. Typically, these are classified as solid glomus tumors. You may have a glomangioma or a glomangiomyoma. In most cases of glomus tumors, you will see that they're well circumscribed, solid lesions composed of sheets of uniform cells with pale or eosinophilic cytoplasm, well defined clear margins, and round or ovoid punched out central nuclei. Small blood vessels are uniformly distributed in the tumor. Stroma is often edematous, and extensive myxoid change may be present. Mitotic figures may be conspicuous in some cases. Cytologic atypia is usually absent. Here you see these really monotonous uh, glomus cells, pretty much filling up the entire lesion, separated out by these areas of thin walled vessels. More example of that monotonous proliferation of glomus cells, again, with intervening vessels. On lower power, you'd be able to see the well-circumscribed nature of this proliferation. More examples of glomus cells, very round, monotonous cells. Looks like you just copied and pasted them throughout the tumor. Glomangiomas are less well-defined. So they're, they're more ill-defined lesions here. And that's kind of the key to making the diagnosis between a glomus tumor and a glomangioma. So they're obviously made of very similar uh, monotonous cells with the glomangioma, but you're going to have more large vascular spaces spread out throughout the lesion. It's going to be a lot more ill-defined. So here you see examples of an ill-defined vascular um, neoplasm here. And on the right side, you can see even intervening smooth muscle, glomus cells, et cetera, are lining those vessels. Another example of a glomangioma here. So you can kind of think about the differences between glomus and glomangioma. A glomus tumor implies it's a more solitary, well-circumscribed neoplasm. A glomangioma is more of an ill-defined malformation. You can have solitary or multiple lesions. And there is a, a role of genetics here with the GLMN gene being um, abnormal. You can have glomus tumors mostly in young adults on the acral and subungual locations, whereas glomangiomas are often found in infancy and childhood, and they can happen in any location. As I said, the glomus tumors are typically more painful and the glomangiomas, you might have some pain, but they're not as painful typically. Exacerbating factors for glomus tumors include temperature and pressure, whereas with the glomangioma, it's more of menstruation and pregnancy. On pathology, you're gonna look for glomus cells with blood vessels. However, in a glomangioma, it's gonna be more of the blood vessels with glomus cells. And as I, Mentioned before, glomus tumors are usually more encapsulated, whereas glomangiomas are not. Unfortunately, you can have malignant glomus tumors. 
So all this is, although this is rare, if you did see a glomus tumor, but you notice significant amounts of mitotic figures and uh, nuclear pleomorphism, you would have to entertain the diagnosis of malignant glomus tumor. Moving on to something quite common, a lobular capillary hemangioma, also known as a pyogenic granuloma. That is a double misnomer. So pyogenic implies that there is a neutrophilic-based infection of some sort, um, pyogenic inflammation. And although you can have a presence of neutrophils within these lesions, it's not the primary underlying pathology. And granuloma suggests that there would be some type of granulomatous inflammation. However, that's not the case either. So pyogenic granuloma is a name that's so well established that it's often used. However, I like to refer to these lesions as lobular capillary hemangiomas because that sounds more accurate in describing the nature of the lesion. So these are common proliferative lesions that occur shortly after trauma or infection. They typically grow rapidly in the first few weeks before stabilizing as elevated bright red papules, typically one to two centimeters in size. Often affects children or young adults. You can see them on the hands, fingers, and face, especially the lips and the gums as being the most common sites. The pathogenesis is most likely a reactive phenomenon. And as I said, it's a double misnomer. So lobulary capillary mangiomas can look like a bright red papule or nodule. They're often bleeding. And so the differential diagnosis in dermatology for a bleeding pink to red papule is quite large. And so oftentimes these are biopsy because there's clinical concern. And it's just better to prove that indeed these are, um, that it is a benign reactive vascular lesion and not something much more ominous. So we do get these biopsies quite often. So on the histopathology, you'll see a polypoid mass of angiomatous tissue protruding above the surrounding skin, and that produces often a collarette of acanthotic epidermis around the base. An intact flattened epidermis may cover the entire lesion, but you'll often see surface erosions as that epidermis expands and then breaks, allowing the vessels to bleed to the outside surface. In ulcerated lesions, a superficial inflammatory cell reaction with neutrophils can give rise to an appearance of suggestive of granulation tissue. So that's kind of where that misnomer came from of pyogenic granuloma. The angiomatous tissue tends to occur in discrete masses or lobules. Oftentimes you'll find a surrounding myxoid pale stroma. Mitotic activity varies and can be prominent. So here you see that nice collarette wrapping around the lobular capillary hemangioma. On higher power, you'll see lobular architecture composed of very thin walled spaces and endothelial cells. I frequently do find mitotic figures within these lesions as well. You can have an intravascular pyogenic granuloma where it basically looks like lobular capillary hemangioma, but it's within a vascular space. Here's an example of that where you've got this intravascular proliferation that looks exactly like a lobular capillary hemangioma. Moving on to bacillary angiomatosis, this is actually an infectious vascular proliferation often occurring in HIV patients. It's caused by Bartonella hensley or Bartonella quintana, which is transmitted via lice, ticks, and fleas. Bartonella hensley and Bartonella quintana are gram-negative facultative intracellular bacteria, the only bacteria able to invade and live inside a red blood cell. The clinical presentations of vascillary angiomatosis include py pyogenic granuloma-like or dusky red lesions with collarettes, subcutaneous nodules, and hyperpigmented plaques in African-American patients. So here you see this proliferation of papular papules and nodules, very um, red to violaceous in nature. Definitely um, can see the pyogenic granuloma or lobular capillary capillary hemangioma-like clinical appearance. 
Other things on your differential diagnosis here would include papacy sarcoma, especially in uh, patients with HIV. On histopathology, you're going to look for low power. Um, first, you're going to look at low power in superficial lesions, and you may notice that they look essentially identical to a pyogenic granuloma or a lobular capillary angioma. However, in bacillary angiomatosis, the endothelial cells often have abundant pale cytoplasm. Aggregates of neutrophils are present throughout the lesion, often in relation to clumps of granular basophilic material. So this granular basophilic material, it's like a purple collection of material are essentially these, um, these bacteria that are within the lesion itself. And so if you identify those, that may help you make the diagnosis. The basophilic material shows those bacilli when stained with worthen starry or GM sustains. So as you look throughout one of these lesions, it definitely can look a lot like a capillary, lobular capillary hemangioma, but you'll be able to find some areas that are more basophilic staining that are just kind of within the, the stroma itself. Here you can see some very rounded vessels and walled um, thin walls and uh, in many cases, a lobular pattern and arrangement. Again, as with a pyogenic granuloma slash lobular capillary mangioma, you'll see some areas of clusters of neutrophils depending on um, ulceration status, but however, also neutrophils are definitely probably going into to fight the infection. So on Worth and Starry stain, you can start to highlight those uh, bacterial organisms here that are uh, on H and E often corresponding with more purple basophilic regions. Another example of worth and starry stain highlighting the organisms in bacillary angiomatosis. Moving on to angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia. This is also known as an epithelioid hemangioma. So when you hear epithelioid hemangioma, you can think it means the exact same thing as angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia. The cause or the etiology is controversial. Many people think it's a reactive process due to trauma versus vascular tumor versus pseudolymphoma. There may be different subsets that have different etiologies as well, and that's not entirely understood. Most lesions occur superficially as peritic papules and plaques at or around the external ear. The subcutaneous lesions may occur typically in adults as slow growing firm subcutaneous swellings in the head and neck region. You also have a predilection for the pre and post auricular areas. And peripheral eosinophilia is present in up to 15%. So not just in the tissue, but also in the circulation. Here's the classic proliferation of pink papules and nodules around the ear. Clinically, that is a classic codochrome that you should be able to identify, at least put angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia slash epithelioid hemangioma at the top of your differential there. The key features on histopathology include central thick-walled vessels with hobnail endothelium, peripheral proliferation of smaller vessels, and nodular lymphoid aggregates with eosinophils. So it almost looks like a lymph node from low power. That's how dense these lymphoid aggregates can be. And on higher power, you'll notice a lot of eosinophils within these lesions as well. On higher power, you may notice um, not in addition to the endothelial um, hobnailing scattered eosinophils within the stroma. Here's another example of those hobnailed endothelial cells that you can see in this entity. You can see hobnail endothelial cells with, within multiple entities. So just because you see Hobnail endothelial cells doesn't mean that that's the diagnosis. Um, however, you want to at least look around and, and for, at low power and see that you've got a lymphoid aggregates as well as diffuse eosinophils. And then you can put angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia in your differential. There's a related entity called Kimura's disease. The main feature here is it lacks those central thick-walled vessels with hobnail endothelium, but you still get the deep lymphoid nodules with eosinophils. You see peripheral eosinophilia in these patients and elevated IgE as well. Oftentimes, these are um, deeper 
neoplastic processes or uh, reactive inflammatory processes underneath the skin and re results in large mass effect swelling. So if you wanted to compare uh, Kimmerer's disease with angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia, you can think that Kimmerer's disease often occurs in Asian males as a single lesion that does not cause pain in the head and neck region, and they're often large and deep, located in the subcutaneous tissue and even the muscle with a lot of peripheral eosinophilia. Whereas with angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia, it can occur in any race, more often in females versus males, you often have multiple lesions that are painful around the ears. They're typically small and superficial, located within the dermis and sub-Q, and you may or may not have eosinophilia. The origins of Kimura's disease is mostly the lymphoid follicles, whereas the origin of angio lymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia is vascular and even with an AB shunt. Endothelial cytoplasmic vacuoles are often seen in angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophils, but not in Kimmerer's disease. Fibrosis is often seen in Kimmerer's disease, but not angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia. And the association of Kimmerer's disease is kidney disease. So think KD and KD. Moving on to an entity called Masson's tumor, which is known as an IPE tumor, I-P-E-H. That stands for intravascular papillary endothelial hyperplasia of Masson. The key features are recanalizing thrombus within a vascular space, fibrin within the thrombus, and papillary projections with hyalinized course. So here's an example of the intradermal papillation architecture of a Masson tumor. You'll see fronds of within a dilated vessel and hyalinized cores here. So take a mental snapshot of this because typically these are what the most classic examples of Masson's tumor or IPE, intravascular endothelial or papillary endothelial hyperplasia. Look for those hyalinized cores and those fronds which are in and out of the plane of section as well as bland endothelial cells inside of a larger vessel. Typically you have an overlying normal dermis and epidermis here. AV malformations are also known as cersoid aneurysm. These occur as solitary dark red papules or nodules on the face, especially the lip, or less commonly on the extremities of adults. They occur equally in males and females. Most are less than one centimeter in diameter. There is a Schobinger classification for AV malformations. Stage one is considered dormant. They mimic a port wine stain and sometimes infantile hemangiomas. In stage two, they start to expand. An example of central facial AVM associated with AVMs of the retina and the brain in a boy with a syndrome called Bonnet Duchamp Blanc syndrome. Panel D shows a stage three AVM that has led to, unfortunately, cutaneous necrosis. AV malformations are composed of both thick and thin-walled vessels. The thick-walled vessels tend to be centrally located. Here you can see a low-power view showing thin-walled vessels at the top more superficially, and as you go down, you have the presence of the thick-walled vessels. So again, this is an AV malformation. Moving on to an entity called targetoid hemosiderotic hemangioma. This is also known as a hobnail hemangioma. Usually these present on the trunk or extremities of young or middle-aged adults. They're more common in males. They're characterized by a small brown dilatious papule surrounded by a thin pale area and a peripheral echomotic ring. Here's the targetoid appearance of a targetoid hemosiderotic hemangioma. What are the key features of a targetoid hemosiderotic hemangioma or hobnail hemangioma? They're centrally um, located superficial dilated vessels with the endothelial cells showing that hobnail appearance. So again, another entity where you're going to see hobnail endothelial cells. Remember that the other entity that I mentioned was an epithelioid hemangioma. Peripheral proliferation of small vessels 
prolifer uh, peripheral vascular proliferation, which tends to surround pre-existing vessels and a nexa like Kaposi sarcoma, as well as hemosiderin, often located to the periphery of the lesion. Here you see centrally located thin-walled dilated vessels within the symmetric distribution of the center of the lesion. And as you go out towards the periphery, you have a collection of hemosiderin. And so you can imagine clinically, this would give a targetoid appearance to the lesion. Here you see just more of that hemosiderin down below. You, you're gonna be able to observe some vascular rapiding phenomenon. So you can just see um, kind of a, a wrap architecture of the endothelium separated with crack-like spaces. Now these crack-like spaces may make you think of an angiosarcoma, which we'll talk about later. However, these endothelial cells do not appear as a typical as an angiosarcoma, and you often do not get endothelial stacking in these, and uh, the density of endothelial cells are not as much as an angiosarcoma. Hemosiderin at the edge of a hobnail hemangioma. So putting all that together with the clinical and the histopathology, you'll be able to make the diagnosis. Now, if you just get um, a slide, then you'll have to look at the distribution of those dilated walls, dilated thin walled vessels in the center, and then the uh, eccentric or peripherally located hemosiderin. Moving on to an entity called Ecrine angiomatous hamartoma. Here you see this kind of ill-defined proliferation of dark brown to red to even yellow bruise-like papules and plaques located on the right leg of this patient. The key features are discrete lobules, each composed of capillaries, mature ecrine glands, and ducts. So it's a hamartoma, which means proliferation of normal structures, but in an abnormal, abnormal amounts, essentially. So here's a proliferation of not only vessels, but also eccrine glands here. So eccrine angiomatous hamartoma, it's all in the name. Very interesting hamartoma. So oftentimes when you're trying to figure out is something a, an eccrine gland lumen or is something an endothelial and vessel lumen, you'll look for erythrocytes. So here you can see the eccrine lumen has no erythrocytes whatsoever. And the vessel right next to it has numerous erythrocytes in it. If you were to do a CD31 or an ERG, you would be able to highlight these vessels here and the eccrine glands would not be highlighted. Moving on to one of my favorite entities, a glomeruloid hemangioma. These are highly distinctive, rare reactive vascular proliferations. The uh, feature you're going to need to know or the association that you're going to need to know for your exams include an, a, a strong association with patients that have POEM syndrome. POEM syndrome stands for polyneuropathy, organomegaly, endocrinopathy, myeloma, and skin changes. And these patients can present with numerous small vascular papules, most of which will histologically resemble cherry angiomas. I think that they look a little bit different than cherry angiomas when you see them clinically. They're just very large, symmetric, well-circumscribed cherry red colors, but they, they tend to be um, more protuberant and uh, larger than cherry angiomas. Pathogenesis probably represents a variant of reactive angioendotheliomatosis induced by an angiogenic factor or possibly abnormal immunoglobulin within the vascular spaces. Again, why would an abnormal immunoglobulin induce this? Well, they're thinking that with the myeloma association that there could be a role. Glomeruloid hemangioma, it's in the name. So these often look like glomeruli within a kidney. You'll see capillary loops within a dilated vascular space, and that resembles a glomerulus within the kidney. Within that, you'll see some sequestered 
degenerating erythrocytes. So as you can see, the structure, the architecture here looks a lot like a glomerulus in the kidney, but it's a vascular neoplasm in the skin. Here you'll see um, tufts of vessels with inside the lumen degenerating red blood cells. And then you'll find on the periphery here, these crescentic spaces. Again, degenerating red blood cells here. Microvenular hemangiomas is another entity that it's in the name. So you have small thin walled venules that ultimately form a total hemangioma. So you'll see on histopathology, monomorphous elongated blood vessels with small lumens. You may often notice surrounding pericytes because with each small thin walled vascular structure, you're going to have that surrounding supportive pericyte on the other side of the endothelial lumen. Small flattened vessels, almost difficult to appreciate at low power here. So you can notice the pink collagen strands, and then you can notice the more basophilic staining endothelial cells here. You'll find that these are very small flattened spaces within the collagen. This is a microvenular hemangioma. Tufted angiomas are, not, are also known as angioblastomas, but typically the most common name is tufted angioma. They usually arise in patients one to five years old. Occasionally they're present at birth or they arise in adults. They're most commonly present on, as papules or plaques on the upper trunk and the neck and the proximal parts of the limbs. And they usually progress for several years and then stabilize. Unfortunately, these angiomas can be associated with a phenomenon called Cassavac merit, where the platelets actually get stuck within the vascular lumen and cause um, thrombosis. And it's a pretty significant um, cause of morbidity and in some cases mortality in patients as well. That is known as the Cassavac merit phenomenon, a tufted angioma. So these tufted angiomas are often large kind of you, they're, they're, they're somewhat ill-defined at the edges, but overall they're, they're circumscribed. You can kind of see that they represent one hemangioma here. On histopathology, you're going to look for this uh, pattern of what people like in cannonballs in the dermis. So you think about sarcoidosis looking like cannonballs of granulomas within the dermis. So think of a tufted angioma as cannonballs of uh, proliferated endothelial cells. And you'll see on this picture here that they're very well-defined tufts of small vessels scattered throughout the dermis. So on histopathology, you're going to look for that circumscribed foci of closely set capillaries found scattered through the dermis. They occasionally get as deep to reach the subcutis. Vascular lumina are compressed by enlarged endothelial cells and contain few red blood cells often see dilated lymphatic ectatic lumina at the peripheries of the tufts with an insignificant mitotic activity and insignificant endothelial cell atypia. So on low power, if you see this uh, well-defined circumscribed collection of endothelial cell proliferation, definitely have to entertain the idea of a tufted angioma. Here you can see um, on higher power, these tufts of capillary sized vessels here. Um, so if you were to have a snapshot picture, your answer choice includes tufted angioma. I would, I would select that because these are so well circumscribed. It's not the same as a uh, lobular distribution within a lobular capillary hemangioma. And so look at some examples and compare and contrast tufted angioma versus lobular capillary hemangioma if you're having difficulty seeing that. Um, there's no cholerette in this lesion as well, so that would argue against a lobular capillary hemangioma as well. Moving on to a very interesting entity called a solitary fibrous tumor. These are also known as hemangiopericytomas. They often occur in the skin and soft tissues and may be difficult to distinguish between benign malignant hemangiopericytoma histologically. 
large, they're often large in size and have a higher mitotic rate, suggesting potentially a malignant potential. They can be infantile tumors. Um, and within these infantile tumors, they're typically cutaneous with a good prognosis. The key uh, association for you to know for your exams is that these are often STAT6 positive. And this is because of a NAB2 STAT6 fusion leading to overexpression of STAT6. So you can do immunohistochemistry for STAT6 and identify that it's probably a solitary fibrous tumor or a hemangiopericytoma. You're going to look for endothelial line vessels surrounded by a proliferation of pericytes with concentric or curly Q pattern of spindle cells and staghorn ectatic vascular spaces. So this is a solitary fibrous tumor or hemangiopericytoma. You see a very dense cellular neoplasm with that even at low power, you can notice these staghorn like vessels throughout the lesion. Here you see this spindled sheet like growth of um, of spindle cells with uh, the staghorn vessels in between them. And if you were to stain this for STAT6, it would be diffusely positive and expressed throughout the tumor. Now it's thought that um, if, if you look in like the Whedon textbook, it mentions a patternless pattern. And so um, it kind of can ma make you think of a story form like pattern here. Um, and so you might want to stain for CD34, um, and make sure that it's not kind of diffusely expressed there, um, as well as looking to see how it invades the sub Q and make sure there's no honeycomb and things like that. This looks different to me than a dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans, um, but still just entertaining what some people may put on their differential diagnosis. For me, I feel like these spindle cells are often surrounded by a thin area of white void uh, retraction space. But what's really key in making this diagnosis is the low power appearance, as well as the high power spindle cell patternless pattern appearance and diffuse stat six positivity. In other areas, you can see more rounded cells with these antler like vessels. Again, this would be diffusely positive for stat six in almost all cases. Of course, there are always going to be exceptions and uh, you're not going to be required to know the exceptional exceptions on the exams, but really just know that if uh, you have a lesion that looks like either spindled or epithelioid with staghorn vessels, and it's stat six positive, that your most likely answer is a solitary fibrous tumor or hemangiopericytoma. Moving on to another interesting entity, this is called a spindle, spindle cell hemangioma. The key features of a spindle cell hemangioma include blue-red nodules that typically appear in the dermal and subcutaneous tissue of the distal extremities of young adults and children, and they tend to multiply locally. They're composed of thin-walled cavernous veins containing organized thrombi interspersed with fascicles of spindle cells resembling capacy sarcoma. They were originally interpreted as a low-grade angiosarcoma, known as spindle cell hemangioendothelioma, but now they're viewed as benign lesions without metastatic potential, spindle cell hemangioma. They're currently viewed by many as a vascular malformation complicated by thrombosis and a regular vascular collapse. These tend to recur following resection. Here you see the kind of well-circumscribed but ill-defined nature on the outside um, clinical appearance of a spindle cell hemangioma, you may notice this very dark dusky appearance. And so you can think about thrombosed areas with overlying ischemia and potentially even necrosis of the overlying epidermis. So what are the key features of a spindle cell hemangioendothelioma or a spindle cell hemangioma? Its scanning power it resembles a hemorrhagic lung with alveolar spaces with solid areas of spindle cells and then the fleboliths. So here you see what looks to be at this power, it could these dilated spaces, which look to be like alveol, alveoli, um, but you will find these uh, collections of thrombi or fleboliths here. And you're also gonna find um, just diffuse amounts of uh, erythrocytes within these ectatic walls. 
and surrounded by a spindle cell proliferation within the uh, ins and outs, outer edges of these dilated alveolite like spaces. More examples of those alveolar like spaces with um, thrombi scattered throughout, and then the spindle cell proliferation surrounding that. Another example of a spindle cell hemangioma with the spindle cells surrounding these large dilated alveoli type spaces. Moving on to an atypical vascular lesion. So atypical vascular lesion is known as an atypical vascular proliferation. And these are benign cutaneous vascular lesions that present as small papules or patches usually after radiation to the skin, comprised of thin-walled lymphatic vessels and usually limited to the dermis. The median latency is three years post-radiotherapy. Clinical factoids include wide age range, median age in the late 50s, usually one decade earlier than radiation-associated cutaneous angiosarcoma, which we will talk about. These AVLs often occur on the skin of the breast or the chest wall, most commonly following radiotherapy for breast cancer. So again, most often um, the concern is for angiosarcoma in these atypical vascular lesions. However, they are not angiosarcoma. They are um, a benign cutaneous vascular lesion composed of thin-walled lymphatic vessels. You can find small fresh color or flesh colored papules or erythematous patches. It can be solitary or multiple. Most lesions pursue a benign course. New lesions frequently appear and only rare reports of transformation to angiosarcoma. This usually happens following multiple recurrences of the atypical vascular lesions. Complete excision of all lesions are recommended for this reason. Even though it's considered benign, fact that they keep recurring or that they could conceptually transform to angiosarcoma makes them something that should be excised if possible, if clinically feasible. On pathology, you're going to see dermal-based, small, symmetric, often wedge-shaped, thin-walled vessels usually confined to the superficial dermis. Thin-walled lymphatic capillary vessels make up these, as I said, and you're going to see these dilated and jagged anastomosing vascular structures. They can dissect pre-existing dermal collagen. They rarely extend in the subcutis. They lack endothelial multilayering and significant atypia, allowing you to separate them from angiosarcoma. Mitoses are rarely present. And the most important takeaway here is no amplification of MIG. That's in contrast to radiation-induced angiosarcoma. Here you see an atypical vascular lesion presenting a small papules and radiated skin, oftentimes on the breast or chest wall. They can be solitary or multiple. Another example showing you on histopathology is a symmetric wedge-shaped lesion in the superficial dermis composed of dilated narrow lymphatic channels without red blood cells significantly, but you can do a protoplanin in these to confirm that they are indeed uh, lymphatic in nature. Usually confined to the dermis, however, you can have some rare lesions that infiltrate the underlying subcutis. More great examples of atypical vascular lesions showing that dissecting growth pattern consisting of jagged anastomosing channels that infiltrate the dermal collagen, a pattern that mimics a well-differentiated angiosarcoma. So, uh, in this case, if the patient had radiation, you definitely want to do a MIC and make sure that that's negative. Unlike angiosarcoma, there's no significant nuclear atypia, no multi-layering of the cells, and rarely any mitotic activity. On the right side, you can see the lymphatic channels of the atypical vascular lesion, and although irregular and contoured, they're lined by a single layer of endothelial cells that lack significant nuclear atypia. More examples of a superficial location of the atypical vascular lesion on the left, cytologically blended endothelial cells. Again, very similar picture on the right. Moving on to 
Proposiform hemangioendothelioma. These are considered um, a vascular tumor of intermediate malignant potential. They can be locally aggressive. It probably represents a different expression of a tufted hemangioma or a tufted angioma. And uh, similarly, you can get the Kassebach merit phenomenon in these lesions, Proposiform hemangioendothelioma. Usually pre present in infants, but can be present in adults, and they may present in the retroperitoneum and the deep soft tissues. Looks similar to tufted angioma, actually. You see this very large um, kind of ill-defined at the edges, but overall well-defined um, proliferation here. On histopathology, you're going to look for a tumor with lobular and focally infiltrative growth pattern with bands of collagen separating the tumor lobules. The lobules are composed of a mixture of congested capillaries surrounded by fascicles of bland spindle-shaped endothelial cells and parasites. So when you, when you think about congested capillaries, you need to think about impaired blood flow and the fact that these platelets can get stuck within the lumen and cause that um, Kassebach merit phenomenon. So you can see here the vascular congestion here. You could imagine how easy it would be for uh, platelets and uh, erythrocytes to start sticking together and causing thrombosis within the lesion. So the slit-like vascular spaces are a feature. Um, when you hear slit-like vascular spaces, you'll probably also think about another entity we'll talk about, Kaposi sarcoma. However, this has more of a, a rounded appearance to the architecture as opposed to the more slit-like um, and spindled appearance of the nodular phase of capsi sarcoma, which we will talk about. So in addition to those slit-like vascular spaces, you're going to look towards the periphery of the tumor lobules, and you'll find small vascular channels, which frequently show intraluminal thrombi. Hemosiderin and hemorrhage are additional features. And how, how are you going to separate this from a tufted angioma? So these are larger, they're deeper, and they're less well circumscribed than tufted angioma. So remember back to that picture of tufted angioma and compare it to, you know, the, the low power uh, image is going to be more diffuse, high power. You're going to have, um, they're not going to be in as discrete lobules, and you're going to uh, probably have more slit-like spaces with more uh, intraluminal thrombi. As an intraluminal thrombi forms, the deeper uh, normal red color of the erythrocytes will start to turn into a more homogeneous smeared uh, red and then turning into a, a pinker color that resembles more of a pink collagen type. Moving on to pseudomyogenic comangioendothelioma, I want to point out FOSS B down here in the ancillary testing. Um, so remember FOSB is um, the result of a serpent E1 FOSB fusion in these entities. Going to the top to tell you the terminology here, these can look like epithelioid sarcomas. And so the name of this pseudomyogenic hemangioendothelioma is also known as epithelioid sarcoma-like hemangioendothelioma. These are distinctive vascular neoplasms of borderline malignant potential that show morphologic features reminiscent of epithelioid sarcoma. Clinically, these most often occur in young adults, mean age of 30 years with a male predilection. They most arise on the extremities, particularly the lower limb. You can have multicentric distribution in over 50% of patients, and it may present in superficial and or deep soft tissue. The treatment as expected is complete surgical excision, these are generally indolent clinical course. However, local recurrence is common. True metastasis is very rare, despite the fact that these are considered more of a borderline malignant potential, usually less than three centimeters in size. Under the microscope, we're going to see ill-defined nodules, sheets, and fascicles of plump spindled and epithelioid cells with abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, usually scant numbers of mitotic figures with brisk neutrophilic infiltrate being common and well-developed basoformation is typically absent in these lesions. Ancillary tests include cytokeratins AE1, AE3, 
which is often positive, which will make you think about a, um, an epithelioid sarcoma. So that's why it's often um, referred to as an epithelioid sarcoma-like hemangioendothelioma. But unlike epithelioid sarcomas, these are going to have endothelial marker positivity like ERG as well. CD31 is positive in 50% of cases. How are you going to differentiate between an epithelioid sarcoma? You can do an INI1. So INI1s are typically retained in epithelioid sarcomas, but they're off, I mean, they're often lost in epithelioid sarcomas rather, but they're usually retained in pseudomyogenic mangioendotheliomas. And you can do a FOS B stain to look to see if there's overexpression in a pseudomyogenic hemangioendothelioma. And uh, if there is FOS B overexpression, then it probably is due to this fusion, serpene one FOS B fusion. As I mentioned, the top differential diagnosis include epithelioid sarcoma, as well as sarcomatoid squamous cell carcinoma, epithelioid hemangioendothelioma, which we will talk about, and cellular fibrous histiocytoma. So here is a picture of a pseudomyogenic hemangioendothelioma, which typically grows in sheets, ill-defined nodules and or fascicles. Some areas contain tumor cells that are tightly packed, while others show discohesion. So if you were to do a FOS B in this lesion, you would hopefully see some overexpression here to help you make the diagnosis. As I mentioned, um, these can express cytokeratins, and so that would confuse us as diagnosticians that it could be an epithelioid sarcoma. However, if we do an INI1 in this, it's most likely going to be retained. And if it's an epithelioid sarcoma, it would most likely be lost. Also, um, epithelioid sarcomas are typically negative for vascular markers as well. Here you can see on the left, more plump cells at, in addition to the spindled cells within a pseudomyogenic hemangioendothelioma. You'll see brightly eosinophilic cytoplasm, reminiscent of myoid cells. And some of the larger cells can actually resemble more muscle differentiated cells, rhabdomyoblasts, et cetera. Don't let the neutrophil presence distract you, but you can definitely see a brisk neutrophilic infiltrate in up to half of the cases typically. And this could be a somewhat of a helpful feature. Um, however, I think at the end of the day, it's really going to come down to um, noticing these fascicles and ill-defined nodules composed of spindled and epithelioid cells uh, that are FOSB positive and that will still retain INI1. These are advanced uh, lesions, so if there's any doubt, then definitely um, send out to a soft tissue expert just to um, help increase confidence in diagnosis. You could also do sequencing um, to look for the Serpene one FOSB fusion. Moving on to an entity known as a retiform hemangioendothelioma. These lesions are slow growing, they're exophytic, and they can be plaque-like tumors of the dermis and subcutis. They occur predominantly on the limbs of the, in the trunk of young and middle-aged adults, especially females. Occasionally, the lesions have been associated with radiotherapy or chronic lipedema. To complicate things, HHV8 has been reported in this tumor. So we typically think of HHV8 as a marker of Kaposi sarcoma. Um, so for the exam, you're going to want to know about HHV8 being positive in Kaposi sarcoma. However, just know in real life that there has been an association of HHV8 in an entity called retiform hemangioendothelium. What are, what's the key feature of a retiform hemangioma? You're going to have arborizing blood vessels reminiscent of reedy testes. So um, the reedy testes histology may have a similar appearance, and that's why uh, that was mentioned in Elston's textbook. Here's an example of a retiform hemangioendothelioma. You can see these crack-like spaces. So anytime you, you see a crack-like space, you can be thinking about an angiosarcoma. However, um, you, you should not see the amount of stacking or pleomorphism in the endothelial cells. Retiform hemangioendothelioma can be um, 
considered as an intermediate and might look like an angiosarcoma clinically and potentially even histologically. And so if there's any doubt, definitely um, have a soft tissue expert look at these cases as well, um, because there can be a fine line here. But clinically, uh, these do not behave as aggressively as an angiosarcoma. However, if you have a small sample, it's going to be difficult to truly rule out an angiosarcoma. So if there is any concern that this could be a portion of an angiosarcoma, then it would be uh, highly beneficial for both the pathologist and even the, the clinician to have more tissue to be able to completely rule out an angiosarcoma. These typically are not as cellular as an angiosarcoma. So you um, are going to notice that the uh, concentration of endothelial cells is not quite as robust as an angiosarcoma. However, angiosarcomas can be very subtle. And so if you get a sample of a lesion, especially a superficial sample, and it, all you see are these crack spaces and these uh, retiform like vascular lumens, then again, recommending more sampling just to truly make sure that you're not missing an evolving angiosarcoma. Epithelioid hemangioendothelioma, very interesting neoplasm. It's a rare vascular tumor of endothelial cell origin with a clinical course of intermediate between hemangioma and angiosarcoma. So these are still pretty serious, but they're not as bad as an angiosarcoma. Although most cases occur in soft tissues and other organs, including the bone and the liver, these tumors have also been reported in the skin, usually on the extremities. They may occur at all ages, including the childhood, Immunohistochemistry is going to be positive for CAMTA1. So remember, CAMTA1 fusion is the most common. Uh, it's a result of a fusion of WWRT1, CAMTA1 fusion. It's the most common. There is a subset of epithelioid hemangioendotheliomas, which are the result of a YAP1 TFE3 fusion. And what are the key features of epithelioid hemangioendothelioma? So these are dilated vascular channels with solid epithelioid and spindle cell areas, intracytoplasmic lumens, and variable pleomorph pleomorphism and mitotic activity. Here you see an epithelioid hemangioendothelioma with small round vascular spaces. You can see um, a proliferation of spindled and epithelioid cells, pretty dense in many areas. Um, Oftentimes, these may not even look vascular uh, to people because the eosinophilic cytoplasm is, is so pronounced. And so confirming it's a vascular lesion in the beginning, confirming that it's negative for HHV8, you don't want to miss some type of evolving um, capsi sarcoma, and then doing the CAMTA1 as well as the TFE uh, immunohistochemistries to look and see if there is overexpression of those proteins that can increase the diagnostic confidence you're dealing with an epithelioid hemangioendothelioma. On higher power, you're gonna see a mix of epithelioid and spindled cells, um, but more of a predominant epithelioid population here and very small intracellular lumens here, almost taking the appearance of vacuoles. We finally reached angiosarcoma. So this is the worst uh, vascular lesion that we were discussing. It's a malignant tumor of vascular origin as, as it sounds. They tend to arise in setting of severe clinical situations. So primary angiosarcoma unfortunately happens on the face and the scalp in, the el in elderly patients. Secondary angiosarcoma is often occurring secondary to chronic lymphedema. That's known as Stuart Treves syndrome. And angiosarcoma, unfortunately, is a complication of chronic radiation dermatitis arising from the effects of severe skin trauma or ulceration. In those cases, the MYC protein is overexpressed via immunohistochemistry and or fluorescence in C2 hybridization. Remember, I said that Radiation can cause an atypical vascular lesion of lymphatic vessels. Those will not have an overexpression of MYC. However, radiation causing an angiosarcoma should have overexpression of MYC protein. 
post-radiation angiosarcoma here clinically, you can notice uh, ill-defined uh, in some areas, but also circumscribed in other areas, vascular patch. On biopsy, you're going to see those crack-like spaces between the collagen bundles. The spaces are lined by hyperchromatic endothelial cells, and there's nodular areas commonly containing epithelioid cells with a lot more pronounced atypia. So from low power, um, you may not even be able to really recognize the vascular neoplasm here because it's, it's so full of cells. When you see at, at low power, you can even see these crack-like areas of um, spaces in between the cells and the collagen on higher, uh, higher up in the dermis, you can see these dilated lumen and you'll be able to appreciate, um, that this is indeed a vascular lesion. Once you do markers like ERG and CD34 and CD31 on higher power, you'll be able to notice these lumen like areas filled with these very plump, atypical pleomorphic endothelial cells. They're proliferating, they're stacking on each other, they're dissecting through the collagen in between um, around these vascular spaces. More examples of the crack-like vascular space, atypical endothelial cells here as well throughout the lesion. Very, very atypical endothelial cells in contrast to any of the other examples of vascular neoplasms that we looked at before. There should be a high rate of KI-67 indicating proliferation. In some uh, uh, research, there has been shown that PRAME is overexpressed in some atypical um, vascular proliferations, including angiosarcoma. As you may know, PRAME is commonly thought to be overexpressed in high-grade malignancies, including melanoma, and that's what PRAME stands for preferentially expressed antigen and melanoma. However, keep in mind that if PRAME is positive throughout an atypical endothelial cell vascular lesion, that probably indicates an activated and proliferative state. Literature suggests that PRAME is not diffusely positive in all angiosarcomas. However, there is a significant percentage of uh, angiosarcomas that did show positivity. Here's an example on the left of a very cellular and pleomorphic endothelial cell population. It's difficult to even tell that it's a vascular lesion because the lumen are just being taken over by these high-grade proliferation of atypical endothelial cells. In other areas of the angiosarcoma, you may just notice more of a lumen-predominant architecture, but you'll still be able to see these enlarged endothelial cells, very pleomorphic. They're breaking off and they seem to be sitting in the lumen and they're stacking up on top of each other in some areas. Immunohistochemistry for endothelial markers will show the enlarged epithelioid plump endothelial cells. And in many cases, they will not be associated with a lumen at all. They'll just be uh, single malignant cells dissecting through the collagen. Moving on to Kaposi sarcoma, this is a malignant vascular tumor. It's, it's lower grade than angiosarcoma, but it's still considered malignant. It can uh, basically begin in one area of the body and metastasize throughout the rest of the body. There are four types. The classic is considered in elderly patients of Eastern and Southern European descent, Mediterranean descent, 10 to 15 times more common in males of Mediterranean descent. There's an AIDS-associated Kaposi sarcoma, an immunosuppressed-associated Kaposi sarcoma, and an African endemic form with subtypes considered as nodular, florid, lymphadenopathic, and infiltrative. It's important to know the unifying theme here. Kaposi sarcoma, all forms are associated with HHV8 um, for all intents and purposes. HHV8 is positive in Kaposi sarcoma. You may find some case reports suggesting that there are HHV8 negative Kaposi sarcoma. However, I do think that, that, that those cases are so rare that it's not worth uh, worrying about. In fact, I do think that um, some cases that were called Kaposi sarcoma without doing an HHV8 stain were later uh, retrospectively studied and found to be negative for HHV8. So perhaps they were not a Kaposi sarcoma to begin with. That being said, um, there is probably an etiologic role of 
human herpes virus eight and causing a uh, abnormal neoplastic proliferation of some type of endothelial progenitor cell that could give rise to both lymphatic vessels and other uh, typical endothelial uh, vascular structures. And so uh, while the etiology is completely not understood, it's very clean that there's an association between HHV8 and CAPC sarcoma. Here you see a classic CAPC sarcoma clinically with these plaques and patches and nodules forming on the lower legs here on the feet of an individual. Here's an example of a more uh, diffuse and distributed AIDS-associated CAPC sarcoma. Here um, you can see a kind of a mucosal thin plaque or patch within the uh, upper palate of patients. So if you do see a uh, violaceous or red neoplasm within the mouth of an AIDS patient. You have to think about CAPC sarcoma. More examples involving the gums here. The African, uh, associ African American associated or endemic associated CAPC sarcoma here. Again, looks like CAPC sarcoma. Could be a lot of other different things that you could would consider on your differential, including vascular angiomatosis. There's also pseudo capsi sarcoma. Um, there are um, multiple uh, vascul vasculopathies that might present as dusky, uh, ill-defined, dark necrotic areas. Lots of things on the differential for this. We have to think about the evolution of stages in capsi sarcoma. So early patch stage Capsi sarcoma often presents as bizarre staghorn ectatic lymphatic vessels and associated plasma cells. Here you can see irregular vascular spaces. The endothelial cells themselves do not look as bad as an angiosarcoma. You can see this vascular wrapping phenomenon. You can see vessels starting to grow within other vessels, and that's known as the promontory sign. Again, if you did an HHV8 here, you would be able to find endothelial cells do express HHV8. Later stage or plaque stage CAPC sarcoma, you start to get a busier uh, proliferation surrounded by uh, or surrounding adnexal structures and pre-existing vessels. The busy areas uh, have a paler appearance as they sometimes take up less staining and you'll notice some promontory sign as well. So here's that kind of pale, less staining appearance of a more patch stage proliferation of CAPC sarcoma with perifollicular proliferation. Another example of the ingrowth of vessels within vessels, more of a promontory sign. And then nodular CAPC sarcoma is going to have the larger uh, concentration of spindled cells with slit-like spaces and erythrocytes in between those spindle cells. A lot more mitotic figures as well. So here you can see a nodular uh, proliferation. It's, it's much smaller than many other examples you may see, but this is the beginning of that nodular proliferation. You might find some surrounding crack-like space areas and some fronds that might even remind you of a papillary endothelial hyperplasia or Masson's tumor. However, you're not going to see that hyalinization that you typically see in a Masson's tumor here. And then on higher power um, you can imagine with a larger nodular stage that you would have just sheets of um, spindle cell proliferation with slit-like spaces containing red blood cells in between. Now, this may be difficult to separate out from other entities that we talked about, like a posiform hemangioendothelioma, right? So um, in that case, HHV8 is going to be very important. So that's why that earlier entity had the word caposiform in it is because it looks like Kaposi sarcoma. So you want to look for um, the HHV8 expression in all of the lesions where there's any consideration of uh, CAPC sarcoma at all. Of course, here I mentioned the HHV8 positivity very diffusely involving all of the cells in CAPC sarcoma. So we discussed various entities that have a more benign behavior and some that have more intermediate behavior with locally aggressive or even rarely metastasizing behaviors and then the malignant vascular neoplasms as well. So these are a difficult area in uh, soft tissue and dermatopathology. So seeing as many examples as possible
in the textbooks as well as real life examples will continue to solidify the concepts. There's a lot of research being done on these entities and more new discoveries on fusions and genetics are being learned every day. So uh, finding uh, the most recent review papers on these entities will also help solidify your knowledge in these areas. Thank you for your attention.